So we talk a lot about impure public goods and so on. There's a whole academic literature um, around this. In, in global health, there's a few areas that are generally recognized as qualifying as global public goods. Uh, things like international standards, guidelines and protocols, what WHO often describes as normative activities. Uh, those are generally seen as global public goods. Um, others are R&D, research and development for things like neglected diseases or uh, 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 you know, knowledge translation and so on. And, and the other area that often comes up is communicable diseases, uh, surveillance, monitoring and reporting, for example. Again, research on um, treatments and interventions that benefit everyone. So there's been a lot of thinking, as I say. Um, for the purposes of this discussion, I think what's potentially useful about the concept in a world where we're always facing competing priorities and donor fatigue, it helps us to identify those goods that are essential to underpinning a well-functioning society or a global community of societies. It, it's helpful for priority setting. Uh, the concept is useful for getting people to recognize that these public goods will be undersupplied if you're le leaving them to individual countries or individual or, or to the market. Uh, they inherently need collective action to produce them. So it, it, it helps explain why we need to have these institutional arrangements um, that we're going to talk about today. And the concept did prompt a lot of important conversations about global health financing and the need to support these essential functions that keep us healthy and safe. But also it's been a mixed blessing because although the concept can be potentially powerful and, and martial arguments about collective self-interest, it also has um, suffered, I think, from loose definition. Uh, so people tend to throw a lot of things under the public goods umbrella, and that has kind of weakened its, its, um, its leverage. It also led to a reallocation of existing resources rather than growing the pie uh, bigger overall. And it tended to attract funding to vertical programs rather than health system strengthening. So that, that's what sort of happened in the past. Um, and, and I just to conclude my opening remarks, um, I would say that beyond the conceptual fuzziness that we often um, find with global public goods, we also find in, uh, incredible political um, challenges. We have a president, we have a professor, we have policy makers. So what P is, miss is missing in, in, in this discussion? And, and, then I, and I settled on a preacher. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's part of what this comes down to. Uh, when, when you look at the failures that we've seen over the last couple of years in, in sort of trying to enable access to the technologies that have been produced um, to, try and, to try to deal with this pandemic, they've been fundamental failures uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in a sense in the human condition. And, and, I, and, I, and it comes down to some of these seven deadly sins that a preacher might talk about. Um, and, and I think the ones that are most at play here are pride, um, greed, um, a little bit of gluttony and a little bit of sloth, really. Um, pride because, you know, there are nation states and corporations that want to say we were the first to develop the vaccine. We've been leading the way. Um, uh, greed because obviously there's a lot of profit to be made and, uh, and, and there's always been this issue around um, people and planet versus profit and, and where's, where's the balance. And, and it seems that the balance is not sufficiently tipped towards uh, uh, people and planet. Um, gluttony, because even though the, gluttony, because there's a limited supply of these these um, these goods, and 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 countries and uh, regions are hoarding um, hoarding the the products that have been produced. Um, sometimes, even when there's not not that much more marginal benefit to keeping, you know, an, an extra um, x million supplies of vaccine. Um, and they're allowing them to even even become expired without without that uh, access being uh, you know facilitated for people in low and middle income countries. Um, and then and then what was the other one? Uh, that was that was gluttony. Then there was sloth. Yeah. So sloth, because there's a lot of wealthy uh, developing countries. Uh, I, I mean, I'm I'm talking, for example, your Gulf Arab states. Um, uh, you know, countries that are high income, the way they haven't invested in the in the in the in the in the technologies, in the development processes to to be become manufacturing of production hubs themselves, 
likewise in a lot of low and middle income countries there are, there are a lot of wealthy people who are able to you know facilitate uh, access or perhaps think more expansively about how they can build capacity for development and manufacture within their own settings but choose not to do so they invest in other things um uh, and so and so I think that's a good way for us to think about this because fundamentally that's what it comes down to uh, it comes down to it comes down to these issues and that's why and that's why we haven't seen the kind of uh, facilitated equitable access that we would all uh, aspire to see um, and perhaps we should be trying to focus on some of the virtues uh, of uh, th that we all share or that we all aspire to um, to try to do some of this charity humility temperance and a bit of diligence you know the g20 actor a or the the, the actor a covax thing we, we generated we started in the early 2020s the financial support i think germany was over a billion just to covax i think it's close to two billion and i think globally was i think uh, Keon can correct me on that over 20 billion or somewhat 20 billion we're still short as uh, the budgets are there, but I think it's actually been a pretty remarkable global response. Um, yet there have been some negative sides to the global response. If you think about trade restrictions and production, I was chairing a international committee at, uh, at COVAX uh, thinking about how we can increase localized productions in South Africa, where we're building a hub now in other countries. So I think these fairness issues uh, were not handled very well. I think uh, WTO is doing a lot of work in this area and WHO as well to try to you know, improve that for the next pandemic. So I think there has been light, but also uh, shadow in terms of the response, but it hasn't all been that bad. The worst thing has been, a lot of it has been a national response. If you think about this manufacturing part, which I was very much involved in, there have been a lot of national task force. I'm pretty sure the UK had that as well. Germany had one, France, EU has one, America has one, and China has one. And I think the multilateral approach uh, has been, um, you know, should be improved. And I think the WHO is working on that, that we make it more into a multilateral response. With regard to financing, um, as you said, there is a gap. And what can we do to close the gap? So that's my third and final point. Um, I think the first thing we should do is make sure that the commitments which have been given by G7 and G20, and there's a tracker which the UK government uh, put forward in terms of our commitments on vaccine sharing and distribution, but also on financial contributions, that it is actually being delivered and actually being delivered there and not just promised and put into a table, but actually being delivered. I think that's always very important, the question of accountability is very, very important. It doesn't solve all the problems, but if you don't do that, you won't solve the problem either. Another strategy is naming and shaming. This is a very old strategy. Um, you know, who's doing what in terms of financing? I think Germany has been relatively good. I think the UK as well. Uh, US has sort of come online uh, under the Biden administration, uh, but there are other countries who should do more. So a careful strategy either by uh, governments or by the NGOs in terms of uh, making clear who does and who does not contribute. It's an old strategy, but my experience is it works. Nobody wants to be isolated. That's why now we are facing the fact that it's not an outside enemy, but it is something which is a global, which is common, and we, we have to be prepared to face also to the future. So I had already some uh, parts what I thought to say but Osman Nadar has already mentioned it, that, and, and so I, I don't go between the details. But I think that that's one of the things, uh, both in the health, but also in other sectors of the society. So um, we are always afraid of the free ride, which means that we think that perhaps we pay more than the others. And I think this uh, is not that bad in the Nordic countries where we have used to have this kind of the common good systems in, in many other fields. But for instance, what I have been a shorter time in USA. So I, have, I had a feeling that they also very, very strong feeling that, that I pay something for the others. And uh, so anyway, um, I, I was last year, I participated in the work of the World Health Organization's Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development, what you will call the Monte Commission. And I was responsible for the resilience of the, the society, uh, which is a quite wicked question that why some 
societies will uh, do it better than the others. And uh, what's the, how could we adopt it? So I think that uh, it's very good to remember that even the G8, G20, uh, they have a lot of money, but they have not um, succeeded very well in, uh, in, uh, in uh, this uh, COVID-19. So I think that the models should be seen also perhaps in Nordic countries, but also to see that, for instance, the people have managed earlier with the pandemic in Africa or in Asia. You might be astonished when I say in that way, but anyway, to, to earn it, that how we can be together when it's, it's a pandemic. But um, I very strongly underline the holistic approach, not only in one, set, uh, one society with the health and other sectors of the society, uh, and then also in, uh, uh, in um, globally and concerning the uh, 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. And I think that, that have, we have learned now also during this pandemic. We remember that we have the animals and we have the plants and we are all together. And I hope so that that will help us to, to do more holistic system. Uh, but then I don't go now to the mechanism to raise funds for the global public goods, uh, goods because I think that you might be some of you better on that, even the Monty Commission proposed some, some ideas. But um, I really, I'm ready for the further discussions concerning that, that in which way we can see uh, possibilities to use this certain type of still a little bit shocked by the COVID-19.